We go on to the last speaker, um, Flavio Kaplazinski uh, from Hamilton, uh, Canada. And um, he's going to talk, <coughs> pardon me, uh, neuroregression and immune activation. Again, we're back to bipolar disorder. Flavio, looking okay. forward to your talk. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Angelos, for inviting me to this, uh, uh, you know, symposium. And, uh, you know, it's great to be here and uh, talking about um, uh, the topic of neuroprogression and see how it's been uh, developing and, uh, you know, receiving more and more attention. So, uh, we are going to, you know, uh, talk a little bit about uh, ways to model your progression because of course uh, we want to know what it means clinically but uh, ideally we would like to have some cell model or you know animal model that would be you know more uh, consistent with the constructs of uh, neuroprogression. progression so uh, i'm going to show a few of the experiments we did and uh, we can discuss further uh, on this topic so this is my this is my uh, those are my conflict of interest. And so, uh, you know, to, to kind of um, set the stage, neuroprogression, uh, we, we kind of, uh, uh, when Michael, you know, kind of uh, created the term and then we were discussing, we're thinking of neuroprogression as the biological basis of uh, illness progression. And in the beginning, the focus was, was bipolar, but then later on, we realized that, uh, you know, it could apply as well to other mood disorders. It could apply to PTSD, OCD, and so many other things. So nowadays, with this book, you know, uh, this monograph that is being launched, uh, you, you could see that, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, potential applications to the concept. Uh, and the other important uh, thing is that uh, neuroprogression is also clinically seen as an acceleration of the natural illness progression. As we know, usually uh, we have, uh, you know, for mood disorders, you know, beginning of adolescence, we have a minor mood and then some people use drugs and then when they transit to adult age, then they have first uh, major mood episodes, and then later on, if they, they are bipolar, they have a you know, hypomanic or manic, and it develops, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, in the lifetime. If you have neuroprogression, um, uh, you know, on board, probably this is going to be accelerated, and uh, those steps are going to be, you know, faster. So, uh, overall, in bipolar disorder, neuroprogression uh, can be defined or can be seen clinically, right, as a shorter interval between episodes, volumetric changes in brain, differential response to pharmacotherapy, differential response and poorer response to psychotherapy, cognitive impairment, and functional impairment. Right? So those are the domains covered by the concept. There was a heated debate, you know, um, since we, we, you know, we put forward the concept and then it was received with a lot of enthusiasm, but uh, by some of our colleagues, the other one said, well, you know, uh, we just cannot tell if uh, there is neuroprogression or not, uh, and maybe it doesn't exist. However, you know, uh, most of this controversy was resolved in a quite, uh, you know, um, I would say dramatic or, you know, uh, definitive way by the group of Lars Kessing. So, having this uh, whole um, population in Denmark, right, and, uh, you know, several studies conducted in these uh, large cohorts, they pointed to the fact that course of illness is heterogeneous in mood disorders, as we know, but on average, right, not for everybody, but on average, the risk of recurrence increases with the number of prior affective episodes, right? So this is not speculation that happens. And increasing numbers of affective episodes is associated with risk of recurrence of episodes, okay, increased risk, Duration of episodes, somatic, symptomatic severity of episodes, 
a lower threshold for developing episodes, and importantly, as was mentioned earlier, risk of developing dementia later on in life, right? So uh, this, you know, this is there, right? So we have to deal with that. And in fact, you know, now we changed in, uh, in, in a way what we mean by neuroprogression. So neuroprogression is what happens in the brain or perhaps in the body, and that provides the biological basis for clinical progression, right? So um, when we talk about uh, roads that are potentially implicated in neuroprogression, when we talk about inflammation, we are talking about the pathophysiology of uh, this thing here, right? Um, so there is evidence for clinical progression in unipolar and bipolar disorders. Uh, other areas are not so well studied, but uh, you know, in this monograph, as you are going to read, and uh, uh, we are launching a, a, another book on the topic next year, you see that uh, you know, other areas are interested in, the, and the interesting data is emerging. So uh, going back to uh, how we, we got into this idea of neuroprogression. So we were, at that time, you know, we work in a biochemistry laboratory associated with a psychiatric clinic uh, back then in Brazil. And uh, we were measuring, uh, you know, oxidative stress and then uh, inflammation and then uh, neurotrophins, you know, and we had, uh, you know, this pattern emerging, right? So this was about 15 years ago when we began doing that. And uh, we were trying to find a concept that would accommodate for that. And uh, one concept that does, uh, you know, accommodate for these pathways uh, is clearly um, allostatic load, which means, uh, you know, kind of the price we pay for adaptation in a chronically stressed environment. So we postulated that uh, having a lot of episodes would increase the allostatic load. And that those are the, the um, you know, components uh, of the allostatic load equation, according to um, Bruce McEwen. So uh, dysfunction in the immune system, uh, cardiovascular changes, uh, you know, central nervous cell changes, and metabolic changes. And all those acting together would uh, lead into a uh, faster aging process, which is, uh, you know, more or less what we see when we talk about neuroprogression. And then uh, our group was interested in, uh, you know, trying to identify what was going on in depression that could lead to this uh, maybe accelerated um, aging or increased levels of allostatic load. And then uh, we measured all those factors, right? Uh, factors of inflammation, oxidative stress, neurotrophins, put all together in, in bipolar patients. And they were, when they were in neutimia, you know, uh, those um, you know, changes were very similar to controls. But when they were on depression and mania, that was uh, you know, very much different. So we thought, we even put a, a, a control of immune activation sepsis uh, just to show that uh, you know, that's uh, really something measur measurable. And um, at the end of the day, we, what we were saying was that, uh, well, there is something going on, uh, this type of toxicity, if you will. They are more related to episodes, so having more episodes maybe you know, is act activating more of these routes. And, uh, this is to make the point that uh, the type of toxicity we find in depression and mania is very different from the ones we find in neotimia and in controls. And some patients with mania have a, a toxicity, toxicity to the same level as patients with sepsis. Okay, but then, you know, and this is, uh, you know, maybe uh, um, touching a little bit of the kynurinine pathway that was discussed uh, before. So uh, we, we have here, <coughs> you know, a situation where we have chronic inflammation in patients with mood disorders, uh, low-grade inflammation, and apparently we don't have a viral or bacterial infection, right, uh, as, as we classically know it. So we have a sterile immune activation. And the sterile immune activation is associated with these uh, patterns. Uh, they are called um, damage-associated molecular patterns, and basically they are things that should be within the cell or within the mitochondria, and then they are circulating and generating uh, immune activation in the periphery. 
So we measured uh, apoptosis in the blood of uh, you know bipolar patients, and then we found that uh, you know patients uh, uh, had more um, early apoptosis in mononuclear cells than controls, right? And that's important because not only through uh, death cell uh, cell death, but uh, actually through um, apoptosis, you can have the release of these dumps uh, in the circulation. And dumps, you know, um, I think um, Dr. Brian mentioned before, uh, um, you know, heat shock proteins uh, and then uh, nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, cytochrome C, they, they can act as dumps and enhance this immune reaction. And then, uh, what we did, uh, we took our patients over there, non-medicated uh, patients with bipolar disorder, and then they were um, severely manic or depressed, uh, non-medicated, as I mentioned. Uh, we compared them to healthy subjects, and then to make the point that this was immune activation, we compared them to a positive control of uh, patients with sepsis. And again, we measured those uh, dumps, uh, damage-associated, uh, you know, parents. And in fact, you know, red is the, the patient group, you know, uh, they were not as well as the uh, healthy controls and not as bad as the sepsis, but they were different, right? So there is, uh, you know, dumps are circulating during acute episodes and they may, they may be driving, you know, this immune activation that takes place later on. When dumps are circulating, they can activate white cells, right? And those white cells can migrate out of the um, um, capillary compartment, right? Um, for instance, uh, this, this shot was taken in the, the lungs of the rat. And uh, I don't know if you have compared uh, in your countries uh, what is the rate of physical comorbidities in patients with chronic depression. We did that uh, recently in Canada, and one that uh, you know strikes as a very important, apart from cardiovascular, is asthma. Right, so the immune system seems to play a role uh, in these conditions, and uh, as they can uh, leak, um, you know, out of the capillary compartment in the lungs, they can do in uh, you know. Uh, some areas in the brain, right? So the blood-brain barrier is not kind of all or nothing. There is, uh, you know, also a mediation and some things can penetrate. And once that happens, once the microglial cells are activated, then there is this whole, you know, mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, you activate also the astrocytes uh, and then when you have a lot of microglial activation, you reduce the number of astrocytes, in fact, and if they are not working properly, you end up losing myelination, right? So this is uh, probably the story uh, within the brain, uh, the more anatomical component uh, of neuroprogression. So it lies in this, uh, you know, white matter compartment. And it's not a surprise when Michael uh, shows that, uh, you know, lithium would uh, actually uh, be a good thing, you know, to preserve white matter integrity. So, you know, to, to uh, you know, illustrate further this point, uh, in postmodern brain, in the prefrontal cortex, there is microglial activation documented uh, um, and then increased in uh, GFAP, meaning, uh, you know, uh, astrocytes. And um, the other important thing is that we showed uh, some peripheral blood markers, right? And, uh, within uh, an audience of psychiatrists, people would say, well, but then, uh, and what about the brain? You know, if you're showing the peripheral blood, uh, you know, what would matter in the brain? And in fact, you know, uh, recent experiments, they show that uh, adult neurogenesis can be uh, changed if, you, um, if we induce uh, change in the peripheral blood. Uh, for instance, um, there is a type of experiment that's called parabiosis. So you can circulate the blood of old rats in uh, the blood of young rats. And when you do that, this is the young rat. This is the neurogenic niche in the hippocampus. And when they receive the, the blood of the old rat, they stop 
having you know neurogenesis. So uh, things that circulate peripherally they can affect the very shape of the brain. And uh, if um, you know in these experiments if they could block CCL11 eotaxin, you know the one that was mentioned before, then they could block this effect. So it seems that uh, you know this increased inflammation that occurs with age is the one that's having an impact. And you know that would fit nicely this story because we have chronic you know low grade inflammation in depression and then we have increased the risk of um, dementia. So maybe you know brain um, neuroinflammation is a common pathway for all that. Okay, this is a representation. This is a young neurogenic niche, and then you have a lot of new neurons and few um, microglial cells. When you have the aged rat, you have a lot of microglial cells and less neurons. That would, uh, you know, happen in, in a rat that is going through chronic stress or depression. We did measure uh, in our cohort back there in Brazil. Uh, we went to, to, you know, to the community to check about the CCL11. So we were intrigued uh, and we thought, gosh, this may be mediating neuroprogression in the community as well. And you can see that uh, it's very non-specific, but cuts across <coughs> bipolar disorder, major depression, and then uh, you know, substance disorder, alcohol, uh, smoking, and uh, being male, actually. <laughs> Those, all those situations are increasing CCL11, which potentially can, uh, you know, accelerate neuroprogression. And then, you know, uh, we mentioned things about the brain, but uh, we should not forget the body. And uh, mood disorders are associated with premature uh, death, right? This is uh, being shown uh, by Jules Zangst. Uh, cardiovascular death, uh, you know, is increased in unipolar and bipolar, right? Um, and also, uh, Pedro Magalhães, together with uh, Michael Burke, uh, reanalyzed the data from STEP-BD, and they were able to show that having a fewer episodes, uh, you know, patients would have less medical burden, but that would change with having more episodes. So, uh, to complement uh, the the data that was shown by Kessing, we can also add that uh, physically there is a price for having a lot of episodes. Um, my time is, uh, you know, coming to an end, but uh, so this is uh, the results of the model that we are developing. So if the blood of uh, bipolar patients, when they are within an acute episode, carry these uh, mediators of uh, immune activation, and oxidative stress, if you incubate that with neurons, uh, probably, uh, you know, we could measure some consequences. And that's exactly what we did. We took blood from uh, bipolar patients incubated with uh, neuronal culture, and then uh, we could, you know, show that bipolar patients, particularly when they are at late stage, you know, stage four, um, these blood, you know, will uh, suppress um, dendrite uh, growth, right? So um, we haven't yet isolated uh, the factor. Uh, it's probably CCL11 or TNF alpha, but uh, we are still, you know, working on that. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, what uh, you know circulates in the blood of patients with chronic mood disorders, you know, uh, is not necessarily good for the brain. And then that this all all this literature takes us back to Bob Post and uh, the way he said that uh, you know stress could uh, talk to um, having a lot of episodes uh, that could talk to have drug drugs of abuse on board and that could uh, you know um, ha have as a consequence a, a more severe clinical presentation. That's what uh, neuroprogression is all about. And, uh, you know, to show a practical conse consequence of that, of this illness acceleration, when you have bipolar, right, in, in like in the dot, right, you have this pattern of uh, illness trajectory in terms of first depressive episode, drug use, first manic episode, and bipolar diagnosis. When you have bipolar and PTSD, all that is accelerated, right? And the point that we are making here that uh, this is a complex thing, 
but uh, immune activation or changes in the immune system may be the mediator uh, or the point uh, where you know this um, acceleration of illness progress, uh, pro, uh, illness scores take place. And then to summarize, neuroprogression is probably related to neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and the action of neurotropins. Neurotropins, immune activation can uh, increase peripheral markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial factors, and growth factors, and can be modeled in vitro. In vitro. So uh, immune activation seems to be an interesting pathway to study when we want to get more insights uh, in this new concept of neuroprogression. And with that, I thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, um, Flavio. There's time for one or two questions. I think right at the back first, and then the second. Yes. I wanted to ask you in regards to the activation of the things. First of all, I mean, bipolar disorder is like two illnesses according to the phase. Did you guys find differences when the patient is manic versus when the patient is depressed in terms of the type of activation? Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, first we thought like that, uh, and then uh, it, uh, you know, it began like 15 years ago. We were looking to BDNF. We thought, uh, the hypothesis at that time was, when you have depression, BDNF is low, and then when you have mania, BDNF is high. So we set forth to, to assess that, and by, to our surprise, BDNF was going down in both situations. And then, you know, we measured one marker after the other, and the pattern was always consistent. So having uh, a lot of uh, manic symptoms and having a lot of depressive symptoms uh, in terms of those changes in oxidative stress and immune activation doesn't make a lot of difference. So uh, uh, probably is something underneath the, the, the clinical presentation. In terms of uh, the, this overactivation of the immune system, does it promote a decrease in immune effectiveness against, uh, say, germs, or does it uh, increase the chances of having an autoimmune disease? Yeah, um, from the extent that we ha could review this literature, it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, cause autoimmune uh, changes. And um, uh, but uh, in a way, it, you can think like that uh, using the concept of allostatic loads. If you have this chronic stress, the immune system is always in a defense mode, right? So. Um, it, it, it is activated, it can fight, uh, you know, uh, risk uh, better, but probably is uh, producing also some things that are not necessarily good in the long term, right? So this is the way we should look at it. Um, I, I've been discussing this uh, uh, with Bruce McHugh and, and other people from the aging area, because, uh, you know, uh, we don't suppose that, uh, you know, human beings evolved uh, in a very peaceful environment. They were in the cave, you know, um, just making barbecue and very happy. So probably that was a very stressful time. However, uh, people lived uh, uh, to their 30s, right? Uh, 35 was, uh, you know, some of the uh, people that lived the most. So in a way, this pathology of chronic uh, mental disorder is something new, right? Uh, we are facing this uh, different scenario. And now, uh, you know, we, we have to see, you know, what are the consequences of having this immune activation along uh, one entire life, per perhaps. And uh, th this is the, the way we think about it. Um, there was another question. I would ask you a clinical suggestion. All these findings are <coughs> increasing the burden to the psychiatrist. I believe we must become super physicians because most of our patients have diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and many other clinical conditions there that frequently are badly controlled by their uh, clinicians. But we must pay attention to this. What would you suggest to increase our uh, action to them, to increase our communication to colleagues in order to uh, 
better follow the, the treatment of, uh, of the psychiatric disorder. Yeah. M may I? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, um, the, the whole concept of neuroprogression and staging uh, is, uh, you know, brought into, you know, as a contribution to, to deal exactly with that. So, uh, we have to, to shift the focus of, uh, you know, treating cross-sectionally our patients into managing the illness trajectory is a long-term approach and then reducing damage as much as we can. So, um, what, uh, you know, people are doing, for instance, over there in Canada, uh, as soon as patients are diagnosed, is to put them into protocols to, to kind of, uh, you know, check uh, how they are doing in terms of meta metabolic changes, right? And uh, they are, in a way, um, uh, being treated or, uh, uh, you know, assessed as they were pre-diabetics, right? So, um, this is a way to kind of, uh, you know, maybe correct early on uh, things and prevent, uh, you know, this uh, bad metabolic dysfunction uh, that you were mentioning. So uh, this is already uh, taking place. And, uh, you know, to be fair, uh, of course, we shouldn't put uh, in ourselves the demand of being super doctors, but we can learn from the family doctors and do what they do. Right, so when they find uh, somebody that is, uh, you know, having a um, parent that, uh, you know, that they are convinced that they are going to develop uh, uh, diabetes later on, uh, they start to change things now. So maybe that's what we should do, and, uh, in, in, you know, convince patients to have a healthier lifestyle and more exercise, uh, you know, healthier food, and uh, you know, and better lifestyle as much as they can. Yeah. I'd like to make a quick comment in response to your question. Everything that uh, Flavio said, I fully agree with. Uh, I don't know about what country you work in. Brazil. Brazil. Um, and I, I don't know how this particular issue is dealt with in European countries, but I can tell you in the United States, uh, surprise, surprise, there is an interesting trend <clears throat> yet to be fully uh, developed and implemented called collaborative care. The basic principle behind collaborative care is to do exactly what you're saying, to have teams of psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health professionals work collaboratively with primary care physicians. That means that we share a space together. We are part of their clinics and they are part of our clinics. So that when we see a patient who has a complex picture of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and on and on and on, we don't have to wait for two or three months in some countries to get an appointment to see a primary care physician, which is often the case in the United States and possibly other countries as well. We've got to be together as a team on the same spot at the same time and work collaboratively. Then we'll, we'll make progress. Very good point. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think we'll have to um, uh, bring this session uh, to a close now. Um, before thanking uh, my co-speakers and uh, Adid for um, Paul Lavender for uh, bringing us together, um, I'd like to just bring your attention um, to the um, cargo stand and the book on neuroprogression in psychiatric disorders, uh, which in fact, um, I think it's being launched at 11 o'clock. <coughs> yes, yes, the, um, the cargo stand. Cargo um, stand. And Loss will do a book signing. Yes. Uh, so uh, please go along. Um, Buy the book because this will uh, help Angelos and myself to survive for another week. <laughs> um, week. Yeah, we, yes, yes. Barely a day. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that, he's American. I'm, I'm Irish. Um, uh, but it is there is a discount, of course, uh, a big discount, making it worthwhile. The last point is you will notice that um, there are recordings made of this symposium. So if you want to follow it through. Uh, there is, in fact, a website uh, which is mentioned here. So thank you for coming. Thank you for my uh, co-speakers. Enjoy your time.